Again, good morning. We want to welcome this service of worship here this morning at Christ Church. It is great to see all of you here. Um, I, uh, I hope that as we worship together, you experience the presence of the Lord in a powerful way. And uh, whether it be through the music that we sing or um, the prayers that are offered or the words that are spoken or the interactions we have with one another, I pray that you would experience the presence of the Lord in a way that really draws you closer to Him, um, perhaps in ways that you haven't been drawn to Him in a long while. And so that's my hope and prayer today. I want to tell you about one thing that's coming up. Uh, actually, two things. First of all, um, immediately following this service this morning, uh, we're going to have a reception for Steve Godby. Um, he has recently retired as Director of, of Missions Ministries here at the church. And I'm looking for him because I understood that they were going to be in this service. Well, um, oh, there he is. There's Steve. Um, Steve, we're, we're going to, I'm telling him about our reception that you didn't want us to have, but the missions team was insistent. So following this service, uh, and it's going to run until about 1115 this morning, um, we're going to have a reception in the commons uh, where you can just stop and, and hug Steve's neck and thank him for uh, for all that he has done to move our missions ministries um, to, to where they are today. Also, when speaking of missions, next Sunday, we're going to be having, having a missions dinner. There's a, 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 a pamphlet in your uh, bulletin this morning that tells you all about it. And I hope you'll, you'll take a little time to, uh, to read through this pamphlet. This is a major fundraiser for our student missions ministries. And um, so this missions dinner is, uh, if you've never attended one, you, you really ought to come. It's a, it's a, a fantastic event. Um, the youth choir sings and, and uh, students give testimonies about uh, some of the things that they've experienced through their mission work over the course of the past year. And, and uh, you'll hear about uh, some about what's going to be coming up this, this next year. It's a great, great event. Uh, it's going to take place next Sunday uh, from 5 to 7.30 in the hall. And so uh, I hope you'll consider being a part of that. You'll notice in the pew rack in front of you, there is a Next Steps card. Uh, would you consider filling that out this morning? Um, you can actually fill it out and it, fill the card out itself, or there's a QR code on the, on the card that you can scan with your phone, and that'll take you to a page where you can let us know you're here. Um, it, and, and you can also find out information about how you can uh, become more deeply engaged in all that's going on here at Christ Church. So take a look at that Next Steps card. 
and, uh, and, and let us know that you're here at the very least uh, or spend a little more time thinking about how God may be um, inviting you to take one more step here at Christ Church. Christ Church family, let's worship together. Good morning, Christ Church. It's wonderful to be with you today. I invite you to join me in a word of prayer before we enter into worship. God, you are sufficient and you are wonderful and we praise you and worship you now and we thank you, Lord, for your provision. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, for your forgiveness. We offer our praises to you now, Lord, and we invite you to come and inhabit our worship according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, would you stand and join me for our first hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. you to join us as we continue our worship with Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Thank you. 
Together we affirm our shared Christian faith using the wonderful ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen, amen. Thank you. Would you please be seated? Good morning. I do want to just remind you that uh, for those of you that are not aware, uh, Rick Floyd passed away, and there will be a memorial service for him this Tuesday at uh, one o'clock uh, here in the sanctuary. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for sending your son Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who is the way and the truth and the life. You uh, reveal yourself through him to us and we thank you and we praise you. And we've come here together today to offer ourselves to you in worship and praise. And so now, as a people of faith, we join together in the prayer that you taught us. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glorious things of thee are spoken. broken. 
we come to the time in our worship service where we have the opportunity to worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And so I want to invite our ushers to come forward now uh, so that we can prepare to do just that. And, and I just want to uh, take this as an opportunity to, to thank you for the way you so generously support the programs and ministries of this church through your giving. Uh, we've got a group of, of uh, middle school and high school students that um, have been at Camp Choye. I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, Choye, um, this past weekend. And, uh, and at the, actually, they're still there. They're coming back today. But they've had a wonderful experience. And, and it's because of uh, the way you so faithfully give um, that, that enables us to be able to, to have these kinds of ministries for our students. And, uh, and they're not just ministries that, um, that, that lead them to have enjoyable experiences. These are ministries that, that, that shape them and form them in their faith. And, uh, and in, in a number of cases, lead them to faith. And so I thank you for what you do. And I thank you for all that you do to help make ministry happen here at Christ Church. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, I thank you so much for this opportunity that you are giving us right here and right now to worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Lord, there are so many needs that surround us in our community and in our world. There are people who are hurting. There are people who are in need. There are people who don't know your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, the call into the world is so strong. And so the opportunity we have right now to help make that kind of ministry happen, to to reach people who are in need or who are without Jesus in our community and even in the uttermost parts of the world is so great. So, Lord, take these gifts that we offer you today and put them to use so that your kingdom would be made glorified and your word would be proclaimed and lives would be changed and hearts would be transformed and eternal destinies would be shaped by the ministry that happens because of the gifts that we give. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Jennifer Schollmeyer, and my husband, Alan, and I have been attending church here for over three years, and we're gr very grateful for all of the connections and relationships and learning and growth that we've had here so far. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. This morning's scripture reading is from the ESV translation of the Bible and can be found in the book of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, I want to invite you to take out your sermon notes. The sermon notes provide a, a, a pathway through this message that we're going to spend some time in over the next few minutes. And I want to encourage you to use these sermon notes to just sort of um, stay with me and, and, and write down anything that, that, might, that the Holy Spirit might place in your mind that is unrelated to any blank that's on the page. Uh, I just want to encourage you to, to use them that way. I also want to draw your attention to the prayer request that's on the back of that sermon note page. It's one of the prayer requests that was offered up last Sunday at one of our worship services. And I want to just encourage you to, uh, to lift that request up during your prayer time this week. I also want to encourage you to, uh, to, to write down a prayer request that you might have if you have one. There are prayer request cards in the pew rack in front of you. And when we sing our, our when you come to take communion this morning, actually, um, you can bring those prayer request cards up, place them on the prayer rail, or uh, when we sing our closing hymn, you can bring them forward then as well. But I want to encourage you, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to offer up, please um, share it with us. And we have a, um, a group of people that will be meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Um, to begin praying over these prayer requests. And so I encourage you to, to let us know what, what the needs are that you're aware of that we need to be praying for. Will you pray with me now? Father, I thank you for this time that you've given us to be together. Lord, I thank you for the, the way that you move in our lives and the loving care that you um, just sort of place around us through that love. Lord, I pray that you would um, just speak to us today. Keep our hearts and minds open so that we can receive what it is that, that you want to say to us this morning, Lord. Um, it, and it may be that you have a word that you've intended to speak into our lives that is totally unrelated to anything that I'm saying this morning. But Lord, I pray that you give us ears to hear it and hearts to receive it. In these moments ahead, Lord, I pray that you would deliver me from me and hide me behind a cross so that the words I speak will not be mine, but yours. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know if this applies to you, but I love playing board games. I just don't play them as much now as I did when I was a kid. Um, quite frankly, I, 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 I don't like to take the time that it takes to sit down for an hour or two hours and, and play a board game. I, I just feel like I've got too many other ways that I need to to, to allocate my time. And, and I realized that, that by saying that, it's, a, it's kind of an indictment on the way I spend my time. I was thinking about all this and it, it occurred to me that maybe that's why Terry Jones, uh, w oftentimes when he sends me a, a text or an email, he ends it with, take some time to smell a rose today. And, and I, I think that's probably why he says that because he knows about um, the way I spend my time. But, but you know that, that stopping and smelling a rose every now and then is, is what sitting down with family and friends to play a board game really does. 
It provides a, an hour or two to just be together, to smell a rose with, with one another. I mean, a simple internet search will, will tell you that, that playing board games with family and friends provides an opportunity for, for face-to-face time. It teaches the, the value of teamwork. It, it's a great way to, to unplug. I mean, we are all so plugged in all the time. And, and playing a board game provides an opportunity just, to just unplug. Um, one internet site said that, that playing board games gets the brain working in a way that it doesn't work during the course of a, of a normal day. And, and, uh, and, and, it, and another website said that, that family board game time helps people develop critical thinking skills and, and social skills. It also improves cognitive function. Um, they improve family relationships and allow um, kids to see their parents play. And I contend that kids don't see their parents play enough these days. And so that's another value of, of board games. They even help kids and parents learn how to be good winners and good losers. So I think it's fair to say that, that board games are, by and large, a good thing. And one of the board games that I have been playing since as long as I can remember is the board game called The, the Game of Life. So let me do a poll here. How many of you have played The Game of Life at some point in your life? So it's, it's a pretty popular game. Um, it, it, did you know that the first version of The Game of Life came out in the year 1860? I didn't know that um, in, until, until recently. It was designed by Milton Bradley. In fact, it was Milton Bradley's first board game, and it was called the Checkered Game of Life. This is, this is what it looked like. I think we got a picture of it. This is, do we have, that's what it looked like. That was, that was the, the, the first version of the Game of Life. Bradley um, called this game a highly moral game, may I say, that encourages children to lead exemplary lives and and entertains both old and young with the spirit of friendly competition. When he put his application in at the U.S. Patents Office, um, Bradley insisted that that his game was, uh, and he said, intended to forcibly impress upon the minds of youth the great moral principles of virtue and vice. How's that for a game? Well, that game remained in its, uh, in its form until 1960. So that game lasted 100 years. And, and in 1960, uh, Milton Bradley's company gave it a major overhaul to make it look like the, the game that, that we know and, and play today. And of course, like many popular games, the game of life has come out with a lot of different versions. There's a, there's a Simpsons edition. Um, there's a Star Wars edition. There's an Extreme Reality edition. There's a, um, a Pirates of the Caribbean edition. There's an Indiana Jones. There's even a Rockstar edition of the game of life, just to name several. So I think it's fair to say that the game of life can be played a lot of different ways. True with the board game, true with real life. And that's what we're going to dig into during the, the month of April. Um, using the Game of Life board game as a, as a springboard, we're going to examine the, the real Game of Life and all its twists and turns. Well, well that's another version of the Game of Life as well. Um, but, but we're going to see how the, how the real Game of Life is meant to be lived according to Jesus. And while I was thinking about this series, it occurred to me this past week that, that 2,000 years ago, during the, the week following the first Easter, the disciples were actually doing the very same thing that we're going to be doing during the month of April. They, were, I mean, they had to, to open up a box for a, a whole new version of the game of life. I call it the resurrection edition. <laughs> and as they opened up that box, they were going to try to have to figure out how they were going to actually live the game of life now that Jesus had been raised from the dead. So that's what we're going to do. I mean, as Easter people, as, as people who serve a risen Savior, how are we supposed to play this game of life? And so I've been thinking, if, if we were going to sit down together and, and play the, the game of life board game, what are some of the things that we would need to do before we ever make the first move. Well, the first thing I think that we'd all have to do if we were going to sit down and, and, and play the board game, you have to find some people to play the game with, right? 
And if you're going to play it, that, that, the first thing you got to do is find some people to play the game with. In fact, in the board game, the, the subtitle of the, of the game, in the 1960 version of the game, is a true-to-life game for two to six players. Which means that the board game was never meant to be played by one person. True with the board game. True with real life. I mean, you look at the book of Genesis and where it tells the, the story of the beginnings of the real game of life. And, and you hear this statement that, that, that right after God created the man that, that just says it all. And it, the Lord God said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for man to be alone. And that's so true. We were never meant to go through life alone. None of us. Now, now hear me clearly. I'm not saying that we were never meant to go through life unmarried. I'm not saying that. Even though, and I, I will say that, that the game of life board game until I actually believe the most recent edition required that you get married. So I'm not suggesting that, 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 that marriage is actually a requirement in the real game of life, but I am saying that we weren't meant to go through the real game of life alone, outside of community. We need each other. It's, it's why the game of life board game says that it's for two to six players. I mean, life is not meant to be a solo thing. John Ortberg tells a, a story about a, a woman who received a phone call from a, from a friend of hers one day. The phone rang, she picks it up, um, she says, hello, and, and, and the voice on the other end says, hey, how are you doing? This is Carol, uh, how are you doing? Um, and the other person says, well, I'm doing just terrible. I've got the worst headache, my house is a terrible mess, I'm overwhelmed with all the stuff I have to do at work. My kids are driving me crazy. I just don't know what I'm going to do. I am so overwhelmed. And, and the voice on the other end says, I am so sorry. Can, can I come over? Can I help? Can I bring dinner? Um, I, I can help clean the house. I can, I can give you some time to do the things that, that you need to, to, to do at work. I mean, I'll try and, and help you take care of the kids. I mean, I'm your friend. I'll do anything. And, and the other woman says, wow, that would be so Nice. Thank you for, for being so willing to do that. And, and then the, the woman who called says, um, well, I, I am just wondering, though, what about your husband? I mean, uh, has, has he been out of town? Um, is, is something going on with Sam that, that made it so that he can't help you with a lot of these things? And, and there's this long pause. And the woman says, Sam? I don't have a husband named Sam. And the first woman says, oh, no, I think I called the wrong number, to which the other lady replies, so does that mean you're not coming over? <laughs> we, we need community, don't we? We need one another. It's why the phrase one another occurs a hundred times in the New Testament and over half of those occurrences are, are specific commands that teach us how and how not to relate to one another. And, and here's, here's what some of them are. They, they, they say that we're to love one another, that we're to honor one another, that we're to greet one another, that we're to welcome one another, we're to show hospitality to one another, we're to have fellowship with one another, we're to agree with one another, we're to live in harmony with one another, we're to be at peace with one another, we're to be kind to one another. As we talked about for the last six weeks, we're to forgive one another. We're to bear with one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to, we're to comfort one another. We're to care for one another. We're to confess sins to one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to encourage one another. We're to build one another up. We're called to exhort one another and to instruct one another and to teach and admonish one another and to sing with one another and to stir up one another for good works. We're to do good for one another and we're to serve one another and to, we're to, we're to, we're to, James, we're to wash one another's feet. We're, uh, James hates that, but, but it says it in the Bible. We're to wait for one another. We're to be humble um, toward one another. We're to submit to one another. We're to speak truth to one another. We're, we're called to not speak against one another or to, to not judge one another. We're to not provoke one another. We're 
not to envy one another. I mean, Jesus said in, in so many words that the way we treat one another proves whether or not we're his disciples. And so all of this attention about, about how we engage with one another wouldn't be in the Bible if it weren't important. And so I'll just say it this way, and I realize this isn't good English, but, but before you even open the box of the game of life, you need to find someone or a group of people to one another with. That's what you need to do before you ever open up the box of the game of life. And, and I'll have to say this as well. Here at Christ Church, we consider this to be one of the most important aspects of our life together that we need one another. It's why we're so intense. It's why we're so intentional about encouraging you to, to, to connect with a small group of people within this church. I mean, I've been saying it for the 28 years of this church's existence that, that the larger we grow, the smaller we have to become. So I'll say it one more time. Before you even open the box of the game of life, find someone or find a group of people to one another with. Well, the next thing you got to do um, before you play the game is you got to decide which version of the game you're going to play. And uh, I mean, when we were planning this sermon series, I had no idea about the history of, of the game of life. I didn't know it was Milton Bradley's oldest board game. And, and I certainly didn't know that it started with that game that he invented in 1860 called the checkered game of life. Here's how the instructions to that game begin. This game represents, as indicated by the name, the checkered journey of life. It's intended to present the various vices and virtues in their natural relation to one another, the whole being embodied in an attractive and entertaining amusement well calculated to interest youth or adults. Each player starts at infancy and endeavors to reach happy old age by the best course as he can select, striving to gain on his journey that which shall make him the most prosperous and to shun that which will retard him in his progress. The journey of life is governed by a, a combination of chance and judgment. The chance representing the circumstances in life over which we apparently have no control, but which are nevertheless governed to a great extent by the voluntary actions of our past lives. He's not talking about reincarnation. It's just his way of saying by the decisions and the life that we've lived before this present moment. Well, then in 1860, the, the checkered game of life was transformed into the game of life that, that looks more like uh, what we're all used to today. And it was a huge success. I mean, it sold over 35 million copies. And, and in this game, you earn money, you buy furniture, you have babies. Now, vices and virtues are not present in this version of the game. Uh, and in fact, the winner of the game is the one who... Um, at life's day of reckoning has made the most money and retires to millionaire acres. In the 1990s, Milton Bradley game designers tried to make the game less about money. Um, they, they emphasized good deeds like, like saving an endangered species or solving a pollution problem. But, but the only reward for those good deeds still was cash. <laughs> it's another difference. The, the station wagon that you piled all your people in in the first version of the game was, was changed to a minivan in the 90s. Well, then in the 2011 version, you can attend school, you can travel, you can start a family or whatever they want. Um, and if the player earns enough points, they can actually reward themselves with a sports car. There's, there's no end, though. There's not a last square to this game. You can stop at any time. In fact, the box says uh, that this is a thousand ways to live your life. You choose. Values are up for grabs. I mean, you can get as many points scuba diving as you can donating a kidney. The description on the website for that game says, do whatever it takes to retire in style with the most wealth at the end of the game. And in the most recent version of the board game, which came out, I think, in 2021, there are no longer pink and blue pegs. They're multicolored pegs that you put in your car. And the subtitle of the game is Your Life, Your Way. It, it's amazing to me how the prevailing culture has influenced the game of life. True with the board game true with real life. 
So while it's true that there are a number of, of culturally influenced versions of the Game of Life board game, you have the opportunity to, to choose which version of the game you want to play. And in many respects, you have the same freedom to choose which version of the real life game that you want to play. And, and so to put it as straightforwardly as I possibly can, it, you can choose to play, uh, to live life or to, to play the real game of life with Jesus or without him. In that scripture passage that was read before the message this morning, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I think if Jesus were writing the instruction guide for the real game of life, I think that's how he would begin it. Do you, do you remember those four letters, WWJD? I mean, they were real popular in the 90s, and in the 1990s and the, the early 2000s. But did you know that, that the question, what would Jesus do, actually started in the 1890s? When Charles Sheldon um, was, a, was a pastor in Topeka, Kansas, he challenged his congregation in a series of sermons to, 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 to ask themselves the question, in every circumstance they faced in their lives, what would Jesus do? By the way, he's, he's the author of that, that classic book, In His Steps, which actually grew out of that sermon series that he preached. But, but I got to thinking about that. I mean, what would it look like for you to consider, as you consider which version of the real game of life you're going to play, what would it look like uh, for you to, to ask, what would Jesus do before every decision you make or before every conversation you have? I mean, looking back, looking back, would it, would it change any decision you've made over the past week? Would asking the question, what would Jesus do, um, uh, change how you handled a situation this past week? Or, or would, it, would it affect a conversation that you had this past week? I got to thinking that for the person who, who, who doesn't care what Jesus would do, I guess they could pretty much say anything they want to say or do anything they want to do within the, the confines of, of law and, and reason. Because, I mean, after all, what difference would it make? I mean, you, you, you're, you're really only going to be concerned with, with protecting yourself and, and, and your personal interests if Jesus doesn't have anything to do with the things that you say and the things that you do. I mean, if somebody gets hurt or if somebody gets negatively impacted by those things, if Jesus isn't in the mix, then, then but you're protected and the people you care about are, are protected, then as far as you're concerned, you're on your way to another payday and you're one step closer to retirement and living in millionaire acres. But when Jesus is considered in all of your conversations and in all of your decisions, the reality is sometimes it will cause pain for you and sometimes it'll, it'll cause pain or struggle for the ones that you love or that you are close with. In, in John 15, Jesus said to his disciples, he says, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it, he said, but you're no longer of the world. He said, I chose you to come out of the world. So it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? He said, a slave is not greater than the master. And since they persecuted me, naturally, they're going to persecute you. What Jesus is saying here is that it won't necessarily be easy for any of us if we make the choice to play the Jesus-centered version of the real game of life. People won't understand why you say the things that you say. People won't understand why you make the decisions to spend the time, your time the way you, you spend your time. People won't understand why you, you do the things you do because the way of Jesus is counter to the way of the world and, and, and the lure of the world to, to turn from Jesus and just live your life your way is so very strong. It's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Or as the message translation puts it, I love this translation. 
take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best from you and develops well-formed maturity in you. That's what it looks like to live a Jesus-centered, Jesus-focused game of life. But you got to make the decision to play that version of the game. Okay, we're running out of time. So let's just kind of recap what we've talked about so far. We've talked about, uh, first of all, before you even start to, 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 to consider opening the box, you got to find some people to, to play the game with. And, and secondly, you got to choose which version of the game you're going to play. And then, then you can open the box. And, and after opening the box, you've got another decision to make. And that decision is, to, is whether you're going to pay attention to the rules or just figure it out. So... Um, I'll be honest, I'm a rule reader kind of game player. But I happen to be married to one who thinks rules schmools. Let's just figure it out as we go along. It's more fun to play the game that way. So let me just ask you, how many of you are like me? How many of you are just sort of willy-nilly figure it out as you go along? How, all right. Well, um, I'll just tell you, it is at times more fun to me with, for me to just play the game and, and figure it out as we're going along, as long as I'm winning. <sighs> but I'll tell you what, once I get to that place where I, I feel like there's not a possibility that I'm gonna win, I'm gonna stop the game, pull out the instructions and start reading them and let everybody know that this is how this game is supposed to be played. Because, and, and this is what I tell them when I start reading the instructions. This is why instructions are with the game because they tell you how the game is supposed to be played. True with the board game. True with real life. That's what Joshua was talking about when he was speaking to the people of Israel just before he died. Remember what he said? He said, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, or if you don't want to live by the rules that God has established, but instead want to live your own way, then choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served uh, uh, in, in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How is it with you? Not, not with board games, but with real life. Are you charting your own course? Are, are you going the, the direction that just seems right in the moment? I mean, remember, there, there was a proverb we talked about this past summer that, that said this, um, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I love how the message translation um, translates that passage. And, and I got to thinking, if, if, uh, if the Bible were to, to have a translation that should be uh, used to, to give the instruction manual to, to God's uh, game of life, I think it would be the message translation that would be used because uh, it, it sort of sounds like that. This is how the message translation translates Proverbs 14, verses 12 and 13. There is a way of life that looks harmless enough, but look again, it leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end in heartbreak. So which way of life will you choose? Yours or his? Well, then finally, before any of us would be able to make the first move in the board game, if we were sitting around the board game to, to play it, um, you got to decide whether you're going to play to win or whether you're going to just play to have fun. 
In other words, what's your mindset going to be when you play this game? Does, does it matter to you whether you win or lose the game? Or, or is this game really about, well, just having fun? Honestly, um, I have to talk myself into the fun mindset when playing a game because I do have a little bit of a competitive nature about me. And sometimes, okay, well, well, most of the time I, I can't talk myself into playing games just to have fun and not think about winning at all. Um, I, I, we, I'm not told anybody this, not even Chris. I don't know if Chris is still listening. Um, but we uh, went on, on to the Right Now Media Conference in Dallas this past fall. Chris had only been with us like, what, a month, month and a half? And as a staff, we went bowling. And I was winning. And Chris was in second place. And he's the new guy on staff. And I should have been wanting him to win. But he threw a bad ball. And I celebrated it inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of that deep. In me, So sometimes I have trouble talking myself into just having fun. But, but th- that is nevertheless a decision you have to make before you ever make the first move. True with the board game. True with real life. Because if, if in the game of real life it's always just about having fun, then I, th- I think it's going to be hard to, to accomplish things at times. But then when it comes to to living the Christian life, there really is only one perspective to follow. One perspective. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul said this, Don't you realize that in a race everybody runs, but only one person gets the prize? Run to win, he said. Run to win. That's how we're called to play the Christian version of the game of life. We're called to run in such a way that we will win. To win souls for Jesus. To win communities for Jesus. To win households for Jesus. To win hearts for Jesus. We've got to approach it that way because I guarantee you those outside of the Christian faith, they are definitely running their game to win. Always. So when you consider how you're going to play the the real game of life as a follower of Jesus who cares about the eternal destiny of the people around you, play it to win it. Always. Now that doesn't mean you can't have fun. And I'll tell you, without any reservation whatsoever, there is incredible joy in the journey with Jesus. David wrote, In Psalm 16, he said, I will bless the Lord who guides me. Um, Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know that the Lord is always with me and I will not be shaken for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. What David is saying is because the Lord is always with you, you can experience real, true joy all the time, which says to me that you can live for God And at the very same time, have an absolute blast. I think the kids at Spring Retreat are experiencing that this weekend. I mean, I I know they've been pursuing Jesus and they've been having an incredible time doing it. And the same can be true for every single one of us as as we play the real game of life. We can do it with one another in community with one another. We can we can consider how Jesus would play the game and and we can play it like that and, and we can play by his rules and not just go at it willy-nilly and, and we can play to win and have fun doing it. True with a board game and true with real life. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the way you are moving among us right now. I thank you for your invitation, Lord, to to step into this game of life in community with one another, with a heart that's that's tethered to Jesus and a a desire to to live life his way and and an understanding that we have a responsibility for the eternal destinies of those around us. And we gotta pursue that at all costs. 
but we can have fun doing it because you're with us and you're in us. And there can be great joy in the journey. So Lord, would you help us recognize that and just, just lean into that every single day of our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite those who are going to help serve communion to come forward at this time. And, and as they come forward, I want to just invite you to go into the upper room with me where Jesus and his disciples 2,000 years ago weren't playing a board game, but they were celebrating the Passover meal. And as they were celebrating that meal before they ever got to the, to the dinner portion, I, I, I'm sure they, they spent some time talking about their experiences as they had lived life together over the three years of, of their ministry. And, and, and I'm sure as they, as they talked about that, that ministry that they shared together, they, they, they reflected on some of the, the life changes that they had seen happen in the lives of people that they'd touched in the families of people that they had come close to. I'm sure they talked about the changes that they experienced in their own lives. And, and so, so as, as they sat around that table, as they talked about the, the way that, that, that they had, had just lived life together and the move that God had made in them and through them, I, I can't help but think of what, about what was going on in the mind of Jesus. Because while their experiences that they had shared had been incredible, he knew what was coming up. He knew that within a, a very short amount of time, all of those disciples who sat around the table, one would betray him, one would deny him, all would abandon him. But still he did what he did. Knowing everything that he knew, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat and remember me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. And when he gave him thanks, he passed the cup around the table and he said, in this cup lies the new covenant in my blood poured out and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of this and remember me. What that says to me is you don't have to pretty yourself up in order to be loved by Jesus. He accepts you just the way you are. It's just that he's not content to leave you that way. And so as you come to this table today, you come knowing that he meets you here, offering you once again his broken body and shed blood as if to say, this is how much I love you and I will never stop. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a, a Methodist. All that we ask is that you, you come with a heart open to Christ and we invite you to come. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you so much for the invitation you've given all of us today to come to your table. And, and we confess that there are times in our lives, Lord, when we don't feel worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are a God of grace and mercy and love. And we thank you for who you are and for what you're doing and for what you will do in our lives. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing to be upon these elements that we're about to receive. I pray that they will become for us a living reminder of just how far you're willing to go to show us that you love us. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
as you come to receive communion, um, you're invited to receive from our servers. And if you'd like to, to come to the prayer rail and spend some time with the Lord, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, if you feel led to do so, our communion rail offering this morning is going to support the Mending Hearts Grief Center. And so I invite you to bring um, a gift to and place in the baskets as you come as well. The table is open. Come.
Oh God, for all that has just taken place, we give you thanks and praise. You've cleansed us. You've filled us. You've made us whole. And now prepare us to go from this place, Lord, as your people. Serving, loving, living as salt and light in the world around us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one final hymn this morning. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to offer, uh, please feel free to bring that forward as we sing. Uh, if you are not a member of Christ Church but would like to, to make this your church home, I invite you to come and join the church this morning. If you don't know the Lord, uh, and, uh, then, then let today be that day that you uh, make the decision to claim him as your Lord and Savior and come as we stand and sing. Would you stand and join us as we sing this as an encouragement to one another? Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide with him Jesus alone.